Okay, that was fun. Um, we're gonna start uh, this week. We're gonna have a quick coding lecture. Um, it's gonna be on responsive layouts. So how to code up your websites to be adapted to multiple like screen sizes, resolutions, stuff like that. Um, before we get into it, um, some announcements. Um, lab is due on Monday as usual. Um, since you guys did finish the midterm project, we're giving you guys a break next week. Um, homework seven will just be a survey and then there will be no lab on Monday. Um, so just make sure to complete your lab by Monday. Um, there will be no Zoom open. Um, none of us will be there. Um, reminder that you need five attendances um, at lecture. Otherwise, we have to MPU. Um, fill out the QR like code at the end of the lecture. Um, and there are approximately five lectures remaining. So um, since you guys are all here, you guys are on track um, to pass, which is great. Um, and come to office hours if you need it, as always. Um, and let's get into it. So today, I'm going to go through like a few strategies um, to, oh, what, what's up? Um, there will be if you email your TA. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, we're going to dive into um, overview of strategies um, of how to construct like responsive layouts for your website. Um, and then go into this special like CSS, um, CSS media queries, which is a cool way to make your websites responsive um, and customize your websites to fit um, different screen sizes. Um, so to start off, um, we're gonna go through like a really simple example um, using several strategies to make this website like more responsive and look better. Um, I'll go into the link like after I go through some of these strategies. Um, first off, um, uh, so, oh, like if you look at the website, um, it, there's like the margins are extremely large um, on the right and the left. Um, so one strategy to make your websites like more responsive to multiple screens is to use a percentage. So that way when um, you have like a specific screen size, like any screen size, um, the percentage will sort of fill in the space um, that the website is gonna take up. Um, and if you look on the right, um, the block actually fills up like 50% of the total space. Um, and we'll see that in the demo. So the, the one way to increase the responsiveness of your website is to use percentages in the CSS. Um, secondly, um, this uh, element, is, this, this like sort of property of CSS is really nice. Um, if you do want to like sort of set like a maximum width for your website, um, and this can, sort of tra traverse like multiple screen sizes. So if you do have a big monitor, you can set this max width um, like uh, property to be really large. Um, and then this will sort of span like the entire screen. So even if your screen's smaller than 500, this will basically mean that um, your like box in this case will span the entire screen. Um, next, uh, oh, we have a problem. Um, if, you, <laughs> if you see uh, the, the, the screen on the left, um, if you look at the restaurants and coffee shops section, um, it's sort of like in line. Um, and then um, as like the screen gets thinner and thinner, uh, it just stays that way. Um, so let's say if you like wanted to pull up your website on a phone, um, but on your like computer, it's perfectly fine. Like the columns can fit next to each other. Um, but on your phone, let's say you wanted to um, have it in, in line um, and wrap around, um, you can, a way to solve this um, is to use like Flexbox um, and the flex wrap property. So obviously you would have to label your element um, as a flex box um, in your CSS. And then you could use this flex wrap property to um, wrap specific components inside of your HTML to like sort of fit this sort of a style here where it's like more in line. Um, and this, I guess, strategy is better for like if you're trying to convert from a larger screen to a smaller screen and stuff like that. Um, and lastly, media queries, but I'll jump into like a quick uh, demo just to like, so you guys can see uh, in action. Um, let's see. So here's that the actual website. Um, and then here's our CS, let me take the HTML off. So this is the website we originally had. Um, we ha currently have a max width of 500, but let's say you wanted to, um, use the width percentage property. Um, so you could like make your containers scale to a certain width, let's say like 50%. Um, and it would take up 50% of the page. 
uh, let's say you like want to make it extremely small, like you could do this, it would stay um, 50%. So let's say you have a phone and it's like real, like this thin, uh, this property will make your website responsive to different screen sizes. Um, let's say you wanted to like wrap the restaurants and coffee shops, um, so uh, like uh, section, um, let's see if I can, oh, let's see, display, all right, uh, yeah, so display is flex here, um, you would just add your flex. Uh, sorry um yes if you wanted to sort of wrap, like wrap like components within a specific like block in this case like the row section uh, which would be like defined in your C uh html you could do that um and it will look better in like a sort of like like thinner um screen um so as you can see like there are various ways to make your website responsive to different screen sizes um, and that could be something that you incorporate um, in your like final like website final like um, project um, if you want. Um, so I'm gonna get back to you. And then now I'm gonna dive into a really cool property of CSS um, called media queries. So basically, um, this property of CSS allows you to define um, certain properties of CSS properties for different screen sizes. So your website could look completely different on a mobile screen using uh, media queries. Um, you could like essentially have like a desktop version of your website and like a mobile version of your website using this. So this is really cool um, functionality. Um, so to dive in, um, let me move this. So we can design, the purpose of media queries is to um, design how like, like a website can be seen across like different types of media. So your phone, your laptop, computer, all that. Um, let's see. So to use media queries um, in code, um, you would have to include like this tag in your HTML head. So like, don't worry too much about what each tag means. Um, sort of like the content is make sure like the website uh, like knows the, the width of your screen and then the initial scale sort of makes the scale of your screen one. So if you so they know like what to reference. Um, but if you do want to use CSS Mary queries, just slot this in your HTML head and you should be good to go. Um, and inside the actual CSS, so where to place the actual media queries, um, the sort of like the, the syntax here will be like a special at ampersand um, and media um, to signify a media query. Um, and what goes inside the parentheses is like specific specifications of the website where like, like basically like an if condition. Um, so in this case, if the website is less than 600 pixels wide, um, then we will have like an HTML block with font size 14. Um, if since like if you look at the top, we have an original HTML size of font size 16. So like this, that block would now apply to only uh, websites with uh, with greater than 600 pixels. So this is like a cool way to sort of specify like what types, how your design is like across multiple, like what, like different widths um, and sizes um, for your websites. Um, so yeah, this is another example. Um, so let's say you have like, you want to nest something. So what, let's say you want like a super small screen to have um, like something and then another like medium sized screen to have something. So this, the this, this screen that is less than three, 375 pixels here would inherit both properties um, since it satisfies both media queries. Um, but let's say you have like a like screen with like 400 pixels, it would not have a red background and only have a font size of 14. So it's really cool where you can like customize on your website in terms of like different widths. If you want to do this sort of inheritance thing, you can. Um, but you, I'll show you that you can also just like specify like a, like a sort of like a range too for your pixelations if you want. Um, so say you would like to match all computer screens no larger than 600 pixels. This is sort of like what the syntax would look like. Um, you don't need the and if you don't want to, um, but the and um, does help if you want to add more and more conditions. So let's say you wanted to um, have 
like a min width and a max width to bound like sort of like pixelation. Maybe you have a screen that's like looks good if it's in between like the 200 and 400. You can use this um, in your code and it will, and then you can customize the properties there. Um, okay, that was quick. So we we'll have a quick demo, um, and this will sort of show you like what what oh, like like an example of media query. So here we have um, a website. And as you look through the CSS code, um, it has like it's like CSS properties, various things like that. But there's also a nav mobile section. Um, and then the nav mobile section is most likely going to be something that's smaller than the current website right now. Um, so right now we, have, we want to make it so the user can see the nav mobile on mobile resolution. So this nav mobile website is a little bit different. You can see it has its own properties. Um, it has its own like like I guess components to the website, so it'll look completely different um, if we get it to appear. Um, so let's say we wanted to make this like I guess um, if we if we shrink the screen right now, it won't respond. It will stay the same. Um, but let's say we wanted to incorporate sort of like the the mobile component in here. Um, so if we have a media query um, with max uh, width, let's say 700. Um, so this condition is what we is where we want the, the mobile um, component to show up. Um, so here we would do um, let's see. Oops. We sort of do like the like this sort of code here. Um, so I would access like this component. So you can see like this 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 uh, pound is is nav, uh, accessing like a nav mobile component. So you would sort of say like I want this nav mobile component um, to have like like similar properties. So like sort of like the like what we have down here. Um, if the nav component has like a display of none, um, then it won't show up, but in this case, we want the nav like nav component to show. So in in this case, we would say like display. Uh, we'll just put in like a block display for now. Um, so if if the like it's less than seven hundred pixels wide, um, this would show. And we also want that the I guess the desktop version to disappear. So you would just do um, nav desktop. Uh, display is none, and then this will this will sort of like um, that, like make, make the mobile dis version disappear. So CSS isn't confused. Um, so if you let's say if you like uh, make this very oh it's not working. <laughs> um, let's say if you make it, oh, oh let, let me just add like this part. So let's say if you have um, a media query um, with min width 700, um, this will make uh, the desktop show when it's greater than 700. So that is probably what we forgot here. Display. Block. Um, so this will hopefully work. Let's see. Am I spelling this right? Oh, that's why. <laughs> um, max width. So if you hopefully this works. Okay. Yeah, that worked. Um, so now it's less than 700. Um, and then this is like a different sort of like website <laughs> um, that's specified in the nav like mobile bar. Um, and then what we specified here is that like it's just gonna have, there's gonna be a circle and there's gonna be like a, like if you hover over it, then it turns into a pointer. Um, and that's the, and that's like what you can do with your website. Um, it doesn't have to be like this. Um, obviously you would probably want to have something that looks similar to your main website, but um, is like smaller or looks, looks more readable. Um, but in this case, we're just trying to show like two different examples here where if you have something less than 700 pixels, it will look like that. If it has something greater than 700 pixels, it will look like that. So 
this makes your website responsive using queries. Um, yes. Uh, does anyone have any questions? I think that is it for the coding portion. Anyone have any questions? If not, we will hop into design. Thank you, Brian, <laughs> for that great demo. Um, yeah, so we're going to do a responsive design lecture this week, basically how to design responsive websites, um, like Brian has kind of hinted at. And it'll be kind of a long lecture, so, um, but it's very interesting. Um, so please try to listen because it's it's really important in terms of like um, making sure that your final projects are responsive and um, overall just a very important thing to know about websites. Um, okay, I guess a quick icebreaker. Can anyone guess how many people have access to the internet in 2022? Just like spitball some numbers. Six billion? Any other guesses? Ten, 10 million? <laughs> okay. Other guesses? Just shout it out. Yeah. Two billion. Two billion? Yeah. Six billion. Okay. Pretty good guesses. It's actually, oh my God. It's actually 5.07 billion. So you're pretty close with six billion. Um, but yeah, actually, yeah, there's a lot of people who have access to the internet today. Um, and actually, this number actually grew almost like 30% after COVID. Um, and nowadays, internet is accessible from all kinds of devices, including laptops, smartphones, tablets, um, even like smart watches and smart fridges and all these smart home items that are becoming very popular nowadays, and even microwaves, funny enough. Um, but yeah, nowadays we're actually like in the post PC era, a lot of mobile devices are becoming the norm for browser viewing activity, which is why responsive design is so important because um, I think a lot of you had been designing in desktop uh, frames, uh, like your midpoint project. Um, so now we wanna understand how we can condense that down into a phone viewable website. Um, yeah, so here's like a graph that illustrates the growing consumption of mobile media over the past decade. Um, fun fact, on average, people open their smartphones 50 to 58 times a day, um, and the growth of mobile browsing activity increased by 460% um, from 2011 or 2011 to 2021. So as you can see, uh, the television is becoming obsolete, um, and mobile devices are like on the climb. Um, again, reiterating the import importance of all this responsive design. Cool, so today we're gonna to discuss why our website might not work on all devices and why it's so important to have like things like media, media queries and um, ensuring that your design is responsive in the first place. So here's a funny example of three cats um, on a 1280 pixel screen. Um, the cats are nested in 300 pixel boxes. And can anyone just guess how this might condense down into a phone? Any suggestions on how this might look on a mobile screen? Would you keep the grid like the same horizontal layout or would you change it up a bit? Yeah. What should happen? Or like, what do you think is the best way of changing this to a mobile screen? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great suggestion. Um, and we'll look at a lot of devices, or not, not devices, we'll look at a lot of websites that do employ the vertical stacking of images. But yeah, you, you're spot on with your answer. Um, a, a great theme of today is kind of like prioritizing the content of the screen. So here our content are cats. Um, and the grid is obviously horizontal because we have the width for a horizontal layout. But when we switch to mobile, we like to optimize for the content. So like you mentioned, we would change it to a vertical layout and kind of play around with the sizing of the image so that it's still a viewable uh, width and 
easy to consume type of content. Um, so yeah, in, in, in terms of like what it would look like on mobile, ideally we would kind of make all the images stacked vertically so that you're still able to see the cat in all of its details um, on a smaller device. So yeah, um, here is kind of like a funny example of like how things get cut out obviously when you decrease the width of a device. So now we have a 300 pixel size screen and a, obviously the same 300 pixel size box. Um, and uh, we need to optimize for that in all of our designs. So these two kittens will be left out if we don't kind of make things shift around. Um, okay, let's look at a demo. So why, what does my site look like on mobile anyways? Um, like we mentioned, we have that one suggestion, but obviously there are other elements on the screen that we need to play around with, like titles, text, transitions, um, layouts, etc. So we actually have a cool link. If you have a device, it's, it's something that you can play around with right now, but here's a website called Is Your Web Page Mobile Friendly? So we'll do like a little test here. Can someone like shout out any website and we could do a test to see if it's mobile friendly. Any website, like your favorite website, or maybe like a course website. <laughs> Steven's website? <laughs> no, 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 no. We can do Steven's website. Okay. <laughs> Steven Huang. <laughs> so this is Steven's website. <laughs> We're going to test if this is mobile friendly. <laughs> Okay, so what it does, you just put in the URL, it takes like a minute, and then it tests if it's mobile friendly. <laughs> and yeah, feel free to like play around with like any of your favorite websites to see. It took me a long time. <laughs> oh, wow, it is. Okay. <laughs> Okay, as you can see, it's like pretty good. <laughs> the text is like, you know, shrinking accordingly. The photo is still like the right frame length, you know, everything looks good. So good job, Steven. Oh, no. <laughs> um, we're, let's try like CS61A's website. <laughs> <laughs> wow okay nice so i don't I actually don't know many like bad websites on the top of my head because i probably don't use them um <laughs> wait what did you say oh my god no, i'm not gonna do it <laughs> um okay you guys can look at Marlowe's site if you want, but I'm not gonna put it on the screen. Um, yeah, so that's a funny tool. We can see if like, to use to see if like common websites are mobile friendly. Uh, and something that you can also use when you're um, coding out your websites and your final project and everything. I don't necessarily know like what the metrics are for like how it runs, but um, play, feel free to play around with it and see like kind of what results you get from your code. So yeah, um, I guess to answer this question, why won't my site work on all devices? Obviously different devices come with different screen sizes and also different rendering engines. So the content design for a laptop, for example, with a much bigger screen won't be the same as like a tablet, with, which is like much smaller or a mobile uh, interface, which um, obviously is like almost four times lower of a width. So what does this mean for designers? Obviously, we kind of explored this with like the programming side of things, but um, as we mentioned in like very previous lectures, design comes first, and we want to be able to um, ensure that our website can be responsive before we actually program it out. So uh, yeah, we need to make sure our website will work on all devices and browsers. Responsive web design is essentially designing websites for multiple screen sizes and devices so that there's an optimal experience for every user at every possible size. So um, I know we mentioned screen size a lot, but there's actually other factors, including browser capability, uh, compatibility and mobile compatibility that will make or break the responsiveness of your web design. And we'll be exploring each of these aspects today. 
Um, so you've learned about all the basics and foundations of how to do a single um, screen size of web design. And now we wanna make sure that it's accessible for everyone who will be using your device because chances are um, with the 5 billion people using the internet, everyone will be using something different. So issue number one is browser compatibility. Um, and a brief definition of rendering. Essentially, a rendering engine is a software that draws text and images on the screen and basically pulls all the code and kind of renders it out to see, to see um, what will actually visually display on your screen. Um, and the engine draws the structured text for a document like HTML um, and formats it properly based on the CSS that is given in the code. And why is this a problem? The ability of a website to function as expected on any browser depends on the rendering engine, which is um, the component that displays the HTML and CSS on your screen. So as a result, every browser that you use also interprets your code differently. It's not just the screen size. So if you use Chrome, um, the type of rendering engine is called WebKit, and then Mozilla is Gecko, Microsoft is Trident, and then I think this is Opera, not Pipura, but Opera is Presto. So those are the different types of like terms you might see in front of your CSS declarations that you need to specify for um, in order for it to work in the browser. Here's an example of how the styling actually differs across um, different rendering engines. So um, as you might have seen in kind of like your assignments, or at least we have seen them because I guess we're grading, um, the borders like in your selector, for example, assignment actually differ based on what uh, browser we're using. So in Opera, it's like a square type of thing. In IE7, it's like diamonds. And then like, yeah, they're all different. So how it looks will depend on the browser and we have to make sure that um, they're all standardized. And this is like an example of what the rendering uh, prefix might look like in the front of uh, your CSS property. So for example, something like a transition, if we want to make it specific to Chrome, we'd have to use WebKit transition. And then for Moz, it's like Moz is the prefix for the transition. So accounting for each of those different types of browsers, your rendering engine will kind of uh, pull those out for the specific browser that you're using. Yeah, there are some limitations to this, however, like vendor prefixes. So the prefixes that you just saw were like the vendor prefixes, WebKit and like Moz and everything. Um, those are commonly used for a lot of simple things like linear gradients differ, transitions might differ, um, the borders might differ, et cetera. Um, and obviously um, when things get more complicated, we can't just like have the same kind of like, or like we can't just include like more lines of code because things get a lot, a lot more complicated that way. So instead of using prefixes, a lot of major browsers are moving away from it and using things like supports or feature queries, which is not really in support in the scope of this class, but you can research it on your own um, if you really want to make all your websites browser compatible. And here's a cool resource to kind of see the compatibility across different browsers. Um, it's caniuse.com. I can pull it up really quick. But yeah, if you search like can I use transform, for example, um, it pulls up a chart of like support info for every single browser. Um, this, is get, this gets kind of compl complicated as like deep as you go, but it's something useful if you really want to like, get nitty gritty with it. So you, as you can see, Opera 10.0 does not support it, <laughs> but yeah. Get out of this. Okay, next is screen resolution. So this is probably one of the more visual aspects of um, designing for a responsive website. Um, essentially, a screen resolution is how many pixels your screen can display horizontally and vertically. So um, you can actually go to this website to see what your screen resolution is. So Stephen's laptop is 1920 by 1080 pixels. Um, your laptop might be something different. So if you're designing like your final project, for example, you might want to use these dimensions in your Figma so you know things are accurate and you're able to display like what you want on your specific computer. Yeah, so that's what resolution is. Um, and essentially not all users will view your website on devices with the same screen resolution, obviously. Um, we have 13 inch MacBook Pros, 16 inch MacBook Pros, like 15 inch MacBook Pros. There's like a bunch of different resolutions. So changing the size of your browser window might also affect on how it looks as we know already. 
So here are some common like screen resolution sizes. I think this is from 2018. I couldn't find a more recent statistic, but um, this is for desktop resolution. Um, but the most common ones is 1366 by 786, which I think is like somewhere between 12 and 13 inches. And then the 1920 by 1080 is really common as well. And then uh, you can go down the list to see smaller and bigger sizes. So that's kind of like um, an overview of like what is most common out there. Um, and to kind of find a solution for this, like how can we account for all these different types of dimensions? We want we typically like to advise to say, to use containers to make your content fit a certain size so that um, you aren't kind of like having to move your content around every single time your uh, width changes. So using a smaller size container like 1020 by 766 is like around the range where you can fit all your content in such that you just decrease the white space on the side rather than decreasing the whole content. Um, and then all screen resolutions greater than or equal to that size will have a good viewing experience because that's like what you designed for initially. So here's an example of that. As you can see on Tumblr, um, they kind of left align all their content so that like the right side is just a lot of empty space, um, which is fine. Um, it's not like the best looking, but if you center it, um, it's still like an optimal experience. Something like Medium also does this where like they decrease the width of your content because it's more readable and like responsive. So including all that in the green container is a really smart way of making things responsive because obviously when you decrease the size, it literally just stays there and then you decrease like all the white space. So that's an easy way so that you don't have to like keep moving around the images and the text and everything. And then if we wanna get lower, so for like mobile and everything, uh, we wanna think more about CSS media queries, which is what we just learned about. So for lower screen resolutions, there are a lot of other issues. Uh, mobile compatibility is the main one. It, it's the third issue that we're exploring today. And designing for mobile. Uh, basically, user interfaces for mobile websites obviously quite differ from those on desktop. Um, and besides just the screen resolution, we also have to take into things like performance and touchscreen capabilities. And because we're holding it in a different way as well, there's also another limitation of like thumb reach and like how people with disabilities might use your phone as well. Here's like a useful chart to kind of see the differences in terms of screen size. With a mobile device, it's usually somewhere around four inches to six inches. And then with desktop, it's like way larger, obviously 11 to 30. Um, again, like roughly three to four times the size. For an input method, um, obviously on mobile, you're using a touch screen. So you don't need to take into things like hovers or like press states. But on desktop, you're using like a mouse pad and a trackpad, which is typically a lot more accurate as well. And then for performance, uh, a desktop actually runs a lot faster than a mobile device. I don't know if you guys have might have like seen these performance disparities, but like when you're using a phone um, and you're browsing through a website, you might notice that it's slightly slower of an experience. And that's because the rendering engines are a lot slower when you're using a lower screen resolution. So for screen size, um, yeah, screen size is much more smaller than on a desktop. So like we just used in that example of like the container, we want to focus on the content and tuck everything else away. And this is kind of where we get back into that first example with the kittens. Um, due to the restricted space, a lot of UIs should stack elements vertically. Um, and that's a really great solution to help maximize the width and emphasize each element rather than emphasizing the layout itself. Because obviously if we have a website that's like showing images and like we wanna see like all of our cats, for example, like we don't wanna decrease the images of our cats because that's not an optimal use of user experience. So we wanna be able to optimize for that content inside. Here's a bad example of the Daily Cows website. Um, and it, yeah, so why is it bad? Basically, um, it restricts the amount of viewing content with fixed elements, like the nav bar, which is taking up like quite a lot of vertical space. And then also like a big ass ad on the bottom <laughs> that's like fixed there. So you're viewing like the vertical width of your viewing um, container is like a lot smaller than it can be. So try to avoid your usage of like position fixed elements, like your nav bar, like your nav bar should be there. So like that's not something you can take out, but like don't put like random ads or like things that don't really need to be on the page. Um, because when you're using your thumb to scroll, um, it's a lot less of a 
good experience if like the container is so tiny. So they reduce the space for the content, um, leaving less space for the content, which is obviously their newspaper, um, which should be the center of attention. Yeah, I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but how do people use mobile devices? We use our hands and it's a touch screen experience. So we want to be able to um, account for things like one handed use, two handed use um, and like cradled usage when you're like, I don't know, like holding it like this. Um, a lot of times we want to, why are you laughing? <laughs> a lot of times we want to, yeah. So here are like some of the percentages for like how people hold their phones. Um, but for the most part, if you kind of like think of the experience of holding your phone, um, it's a lot harder to reach the top than it is like the bottom half, right? Even when you're using it with two, two fingers, um, it's like kind of awkward to be like, like using your thumb um, at a higher angle than it is like hold it from the bottom. So we have to keep that into account when we're designing for mobile screens as well. And this brings up the concept of reachability, which is also commonly known as like thumb reach. Um, and obviously when you're holding it with one phone, um, the thumb, your thumb length uh, plays into account for things like reaching the top nav or like people with disabilities, for example, who like don't have as great of a mobility in their hands um, need to account for like being able to reach those spaces. So um, typically we like to keep the most important content like buttons, call to actions. Like if you want someone to sign up for something in around like the middle to like bottom of the page. And you can see this in websites where they like kind of center a lot of their call to action buttons in the middle slash like bottom so that the thumb is able to easily reach in and be like, oh, buy, like purchase, for example. Um, and we wanna avoid putting it at the top because it's like so much harder to reach. Yeah, so again, uh, like I mentioned, the thumbs are a lot less precise than cursors. So here's like another image for the thumbs um, that you should kind of aim to put all of your touchable elements in like buttons and stuff. And then for things that are less important to actually tap like text or images, you can include kind of higher up. So if you think of like a uh, retail website, for example, your image usually takes up most of the top space. And then you have kind of like the, the purchase button on the bottom or like more information buttons on the bottom so that your thumb is really accessible to reaching those zones. Yeah, um, and another thing is to take into account is that um, tappable things that are call to actions and like important elements should have accessible dimensions. So um, if you have like really fat thumbs, you wouldn't be able to press those tiny buttons. So make sure that they are at appropriate length. So yeah, I guess like uh, to quantify this um, on mobile screens, I would try to avoid putting more than three buttons side by side like if they're important buttons like save or cancel. A lot of mobile devices actually use the whole width of the screen to put a button there so that it's really easy to just tap. Um, and try not to put things too close to each other either because you might press cancel instead of save um, or the other way around. Here is a uh, real life example of Lyft um, that uses really effective mobile reachability. They have um, if you've ever used like Lyft or Uber, they have like a bottom drawer that houses all of their tactical information. So the search bar, like the cars, the like different cars that are in your like area, uh, all within like a very reachable zone in your thumb or for your thumb. So uh, when you're actually searching for cars, you just need to view the map, right? Like they're like the amount of times you're gonna like zoom in and like zoom out and like really use that is not as much as you're gonna be like purchasing a car, for example. So um, they use a really effective way of designing this um, application so that people are able to really quickly select a car, uh, check out and then like get on their way. So here's like an example of a practical use state for that. Um, here's an example of how we shrink things down to mobile. So um, this is GitHub's website. Um, as you can see, the mobile interface is a lot more vertically stacked than the desktop interface. Um, and they keep things like buttons kind of like near the bottom so you can tap on it. And here's kind of like an example of how you can actually use this in your websites, um, the grids and the playing around with vertical versus horizontal stacking. Um, here's another one, which is Slack that has good responsiveness. Um, and as you can see, there's some patterns here. Like in desktop, we typically like to use like 
um, a grid with like an image to the left or to the right and like text to the side so that we're easily able to condense that down in a phone. So when you're designing things, try to keep that into account, like go from smallest to largest because um, that's it's typically hard to go the other way around um, because obviously when you're in a smaller interface, you want to prioritize things that might um, be easier to design for in a desktop. So when you're designing for things, make sure to keep these patterns into account. We don't want to make something super, super complicated on desktop and then realize after you've done so much work that like you can't turn it into a mobile device. Um, yeah, here are some cool examples. Um, this is like more of a fun fact, but um, uh, Apple actually is very good with accessible design. Um, back in 2016, they um, released a reachability solution for those who were mobily impaired and actually couldn't reach the top of the um, the top of the screen for like their thumb, for example. So if you go to settings and then go into accessibility and touch and then tap on reachability, you can actually try this out on your own if you have an iPhone. Um, you can lower the top half of the screen by uh, swiping down really fast on the bottom edge of your phone to kind of reveal like a space where it moves down and you can actually tap the easy parts um, such as edit or like the three dots in your notes app. So this is a really cool solution. I don't think, I wouldn't say like a lot of people use it but it definitely is like a really great solution for those who have disabilities or um, cannot physically reach those buttons for example. So. Yeah, fun fact on like how this is used in the real world. In terms of performance, like I mentioned earlier again, rendering performance on mobile is roughly a lot less than desktop. It's roughly half of it. So um, this causes mobile websites to be slow. And to kind of wrap things up, we want to be able to um, optimize that as well as like all the elements that we visually see on our page. We don't want like a website that is like super pretty on desktop and runs pretty fast to be like really ass and slow on a mobile device. So to do this, try to minimize really heavy um, front end manipulations using JavaScript, try to minimize the use of like animations and transitions and like hover effects. Um, obviously they look really nice and like add to the usability of your website, but don't go too overboard and ham on it. Um, and mobile UI should be as simple as like a click and scroll. Like that's probably the most optimal usage of it. I know I've had to like go through websites that like are so like physically taxing on like my hands. And like, honestly, it just, yeah, it, looking at a small screen is already annoying enough. So um, making sure that it's like an easy and digestible experience is the best way you can go about it. Yeah, so the solution to this obviously is mobile first design. I think I hinted at this before as well, but it's harder to squash things down than it is to open things up and fill in a larger space. So the rule of thumb is to design for mobile first and then design for larger screens. And this forces you to think about what's most important, which is your visual hierarchy and take accessibility to the next level. So try to keep this in mind when you're doing your final projects and like, I think we'll have assignments about this as well. Um, but yeah, when you're doing your final assignments, try to go small and then widen it up for responsibility. Yeah, as a review, um, designing for variation is important. Make sure all your websites work on all browsers, adding prefixes if, if necessary, and make sure your websites work well on all devices. Um, and you can simplify this process for you with mobile first design. Does anyone have questions? Yeah. So is there a way to simulate the website? Like, this one I'm running on like mobile, can you know, like that? Yeah. Yeah, so one thing you can do for screen size is what Brian did, just like literally moving the browser left and right to decrease the width of the page. Like that's like a great first step that you can do for resolution. Um, in terms of like browser compatibility, if you have like Mozilla Firefox or like Internet Explorer or like all these other browsers on your laptop, you can also simulate the same link on those browsers to see if it runs properly. Um, I think once I was designing something and like it looked completely different on like Windows versus Mac. I just asked my friend to open it on like a different device. Um, so you can do that as well. Maybe like your mom has like a different phone or like your mom has like a different laptop than you. You can ask her to look at it. Um, yeah, it all depends on like what's available to you. I wouldn't say stress too much about it for the final project because I don't think we'll be like too strict on it, but like more of something for future use. Yeah.
Any questions? Okay. What? I will stop recording.